Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so I think uh, we'll do one of these uh, booktube things. We'll be over here every week. I, I don't know, Adrian. Oh, come on. I, I don't know, Mr. Adrian. Come on. Uh, it, it... You'll pay for college, and get application fees, or did, have you done college yet? I don't know. Look, we, we'll make money. We'll do, hey, we're going to do all right. I, I it just feels wrong, Mr. Adrian. It really just, I, it I just feels, feel... Hey, it feels wrong right now. It's going to feel very right later. Welcome to Strip Cover Lit. I'm Adrian Fort. And I'm Dalton Gentry. And we are here with this week's review. Dalton, what did we hit this week? We did this, gentlemen, quite a while ago. Like the infancy of this channel. Yes. Uh, and turns out a lot of people like it. Yeah. So we're going to revisit Juno Diaz. This is going to be the short story, Miss Laura. Yes. Which is, was this the first Juno Diaz that you read? Uh, this would have been, I believe, the second, second. Juno Diaz that I ever read. But this is... This is also the second short story that really made him who he is. Okay. Uh, this, uh, Nilda you know, being the first. This is, uh, you've read this before. This is my first reading because apparently I just do what you tell me. <laughs> That's how it works. And everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. Uh, so good things and bad things on Miss Laura. Okay. You want to start? Want me to start? Sure, I'll start. Okay. Uh, Juno Diaz is beautiful at writing in multiple languages. Uh, he blends together English and, is it Spanish? Yes. Spanish beautifully. I'm terrible at language. Well, it's certainly not German. Though. Well, it's not German. I couldn't <laughs> tell you that. Short. It's, it, it, <laughs> shut up. Uh, this comments on the air of innocence and uh, that is apparent in coming-of-age novels. We always talk about in young adult literature how the air of innocence seems to be the big thing. That's what makes it. This is not young adult, but it captures that and it does it well. Uh, Miss Laura, as a person, is both beautiful and despicable. There's wonderful inner turmoil going on with that woman. Yes. Your move. Uh, this perfectly captures the younger man, older woman relationship. Okay. Perfectly. Uh, the pacing in this thing is fast and slow. When it needs to be, it's on point. Okay. Um, you, what was your third one again? Uh, Miss Laura is both beautiful and despicable as a character. Yes. And when you leave this piece, you want to sleep with Miss Laura. Do you? Yes, that's my third good thing. Because that's, you, don't tell me you didn't read this thing and fall in love with Miss Laura. Absolutely not, Adrian. That's, you, no, tell that me honestly. Is, that, is tell an, me honestly. A, that is an Adrianism that you're trying to force upon to be the viewership. Tell me How honestly. dare you, sir? Tell me honestly. We all want to sleep with Miss Laura. See? Anyway. You leave this thing wanting to sleep with Miss Laura, who is a despicable character, and that is a neat trick by the author. Three well bad done. things. Hold well on. Three bad things. Uh, we get the brother again, which seems to be in every Huno DS piece. Yes. It's the same brother, the same character, every piece. Uh, this drops you into a reality which I am unfamiliar with. Uh, there's a cultural thing there. There's it, there's a lot of unfamiliarity dealing with this. And finally, this may be one of Juno Diaz's best pieces, but this is not the one that I would have picked off the shelf. I'm unfamiliar with this. If I were to go to the bookstore and say I'm going to read Juno Diaz for the first time, I would have got Drown. I would have got one of his novels. Well, I, I or collect. other collection. Okay. But I wouldn't have said, oh, well, this one has Miss Laura, so I'm going to buy this. Okay. And I'll ask you a couple questions about that later. I'll I'm sure that you quickly. will. Um, three bad things. The last quarter of this story leaves something to be desired. Okay. Uh, there's just something missing. There is no payoff, I don't believe. Uh, I wanted more from Paloma. Okay. She's, That's she, interesting. She disappears... And there was, the, I, I wanted more from that. She's a very interesting character, yes, too. And I think we got more from that in Drown. There's okay. a couple times where a Paloma type character pops up and we get a payoff. Um, the apocalypse thing that this story begins with never has a payoff. Okay. It, it just sort of disappears. And I was hoping that there was some way that the end of the world theme could have then transitioned to the rest of life is hell theme. I'm going to argue that. Okay. For once in my life, I'm going to disagree with you. Uh, do you have any quotes from this? Yes. I, I'll plug this while you're pulling your quotes here. This piece is free and readily available on the New Yorker, uh, which is how I read this. So if you have not read this, go back and read it now. It's a very quick read. It is a quick read. Uh, but and you'll know what the hell we're talking about. I didn't highlight anything because I can't print. My printer broke. Okay. On pa Now, I've got this in the Best American Short Stories 2013. 
uh, with Elizabeth Strout as the editor. Okay. So on 65, this time you don't even ask about the condom. You just come inside her. You were surprised at how pissed you are, but she kisses your face over and over, and it moves you. No one has ever done that. The girls you've boned were always ashamed afterwards, and there, and there was always panic. Someone heard, fixed the bed up, opened the windows. Here, there is none of that. Afterward, she sits up, her chest unadorned, as unadorned as yours. So what else do you want to eat? And on 67. You are scared stupid at what you are doing, but it is also exciting and makes you feel less lonely in the world. And you are 16, and you have a feeling that now the ass engine has started. No force on earth will ever stop it. There you go. Yeah. Look at that. Uh, my big question with this, my big argument, Miss Laura, reading it from this perspective, from a male's perspective, eh, 16-year-old kid, ah, he's sleeping with, you know, the, the hot mom next door. Not terrible. Right, Miss Laura's definitely a sexual predator, though. But she is a sexual predator. Transition this into reading Nabokov's, Nabokov, is it? I yeah. believe it's Nabokov. Vladimir Nabokov. Vladimir Nabokov's Lolita. Yes. Completely different. Completely different reading, even if the young girl was 16. Right, right. The um, world's different. Uh, well, part of that is because both, both stories are from the male perspective. Yes. One is from the perspective of a 16-year-old boy sleeping with... Uh, what is presumably a mid-30s woman, 40s yeah, woman, maybe? I'd say right about there. Um, the Lolita piece, now you're saying, okay, we'll translate... Nix the Lo ages, flip right. the genders. Right. Well, yeah. So pretend Lolita's 16. It's still a very different piece, but that's because it is per from the perspective of the predator. Yes. Here's the thing. When you read this story, uh, Miss Laura is not mentally stable. No. She's not a stalwart in the community. She's a teacher. She is. She's a productive member of society. But who says teachers are mentally stable? I mean, <laughs> shit, we were going to be teachers at one point. <laughs> uh, but that's the thing. When it comes down to it, wash away all the, you know, shine, Miss Laura is a fucking predator. Yeah. And what she's doing is fucking immoral and wrong. It is. But from this kid's perspective, that is, it's dampened. You don't get that as much. Right. And you say from this kid's perspective, have have you ever been the young stud in a relationship with an older woman? Um, I was in a relationship with an older woman for a very, very brief time, so I'm going to say just pretty much no. How, how much older? Uh, six, seven years older. Not a huge difference. Right, not right. like this. Not like this. This is... It, it's... it's this captures it perfectly. Tell me about your sexual history. No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna just put that out there. Don't put me on blast like that. But yeah, no, I've been there. And <laughs> what this does so wonderfully is it makes Miss Laura innocent-ish, right? That's what I'm trying. I think I'm here, trying here, to here, say here, that. Here's, here's what happens: is if we're if if I'm allowed to use a metaphor, she is a spider. Okay. She sets the web, which is very passive. Okay. And she waits for the prey to fall into it, which is very passive. And then she devours. Okay. And this story ends with our narrator being completely mentally fucked, does it not? Yes, it does. Because he projects everyone after that on... T he projects every lover he has after that onto Miss Laura, and they do not compare. And do you know why they do not compare? Why don't they compare? Because the relationship with Miss Laura was not meant to be a relationship. Okay. Ha flings. Yes. Everyone remembers the, the sexual flings that they've been in because they're so fun. Yeah. And because there's never fighting with a fling, right? Because there's no expectations on the relationship. There's no expectations on the relationship with Miss Laura, and that's why everyone is then compared to her. You always remember the good times, and the fling, they're all good times. Yes. So, okay. Uh, I understand where you're trying to get up with that. That makes sense. Um, now, Miss Laura, there is a... It's not directly said, but it is directly implied. This is not her first victim. Right. She has been with his older brother. Yes. Uh, hands down, no argument about it. So... She says you even look like him. You even look like him. That makes her worse. 
Because this is not just yeah. a one infatuation with this 16-year-old uh, kid. No, she is a predator, and she preys on this type of person. So it is hard to humanize Miss Laura in this piece. And it's another thing is you have to wonder who else it is that she's sleeping with. Right. Point. Because while she does, she does encourage him to stay afterwards, mm -hmm. she does not invite him back the next night. Correct. Miss Laura knows what's going on the next night. Correct. Right. Um, but we get this quote. The, the, did you notice the very first time we understand that um, this, is, this is just out there? Go on. Um, we get this quote on page 60. Nobody likes children, your mother assured you. That doesn't mean you don't have them. Ouch. What does that infer? When he's talking about maybe Miss Laura, he's got this, this, this paragraph right before that is him thinking about Miss Laura. And he says, she doesn't have any kids. Maybe there's something wrong with her. Maybe she just doesn't like kids. And then his mother, nobody likes children, your mother assured you. That doesn't mean you don't have them. What does that mean? I... That means this conversation has taken place. Yes. That means that this has been recognized by the community. Yes. And more so on that, is, is that a ploy at Mama saying, well, not, you know, no, some people don't have kids, but we deal with it. Yeah. That's some mommy issues. Well, that's also that's also his mother recognizing that that's where worth comes from in life, right? Yes, yes. From raising the next generation. Okay. Which is a cultural thing, right? That's not an American culture thing. Okay. Right? If you decide not to have kids, well, in the Midwest, I think it's a little more cultural than, than some places where you're supposed to have children. Yeah, been right? through there, done that 500 times. Right. Um, this is... This is her outright saying, not only do you not have to like it, but you absolutely have to do it. Yeah. You have children. Miss Laura's a freak. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Laura's a weirdo. So the mother knows that this is a thing. And that's the thing with the brother. Maybe the mother already knows this is a thing. Maybe she doesn't know with this youngest son, but maybe this has come to a head with the brother. Right. Maybe that's why Miss Laura's been ostracized by right. everybody. That's why Miss Laura's a freak. That's why the rumors have been spread. Well, you know, look at her. She's not, you know, exactly there. She's right. not what you desire in a woman. She, but she's not what this culture desires in a woman. Not well. what this culture desires in a woman. Uh, which brings up another point. Is she the exotic one in the community? Is she the, uh, the one who's different, which could be appealing to this particular person? Well, I think there's, there's two things that are appealing to this particular person. A, his brother had her. He idolizes his brother. Yes. Right? B, what is the only description we get of the main character? Uh, we don't get much of a description at all. He's an amateur bodybuilder. Hmm. What is Miss Laura? Miss Laura looks like a marathon runner, right? Okay. She is. She was a gymnast early in her life, so she has a very physical presence. Okay. Uh, so there, there's there's a hint of attraction there. Yes. Let's say there is. There's got to be. Yes. Uh, now let's talk a bit, a little bit about this uh, end of the world theme. What What are your thoughts on that? You don't like it. Um, it's not that I don't like it. It's that I don't like it was never paid off. I think it did. How did it? Because his world did end. Go on. He's always building up that his, his fascination is with the end of the world. This whole end of the world archetype. They even Didn't they watch a movie at one point? Yes. That's uh, what he went over there. And that's really where it just it ended, it ended after that. Right. But at the end of this novel, no, his world is destroyed. And you can take it in multiple ways. That air of innocence we were talking about is over. His world as a young adult is now over because he's a man. In that culture, he has become a man. Well, did you catch where he's working? Where is he working? Steel factory. Steel factory. So we lost that age of innocence. And the kid's fucked up when this is over. So if you want to take it from a literal perspective of, you know, well, you done because you fucked up. Now, let me push this even more. In the teenage mindset... Sometimes you self-destruct just to get the attention you desire. Yes. This is him ending his world. This is everything blowing up so someone will recognize his suffering. That's why he's making a point out of it. That's why he's harking on the end of the world. How did he end his world, though? Miss Laura ended his world. By doing what? By sleeping with him. And then he lost what? He lost everything, essentially. He didn't lose anything. 
Paloma was going to leave him anyway. Paloma was going to leave him, but now he is not capable of fostering a real relationship. Right, but he's... Okay, I, I can... I can grant you part of your point. Okay. I don't think that it's everything that, that you're hoping it is because... It is. Because the payoff for me was attempted in the fact that they go... The first time they meet and have sex, he is bringing his end-of-the-world movie to her apartment to watch. Okay. And they don't really watch it. But afterwards, when they sleep, do you notice... Did you notice what Miss um, Laura does? There's this small sentence that Miss Laura sleeps with a mouth guard. Why do people sleep with a mouth guard? They grind their teeth. What is he doing at the beginning of the story? He can't, he always wakes up with his tongue bloodied because he's having dreams of the apocalypse because he's grinding his teeth in his sleep and catching his tongue, which is putting him in the pain, making him have dreams of the apocalypse. Okay. So she has the same problem he does. Okay. She grinds her teeth at night. She's not sleeping. She's got these nightmares. She, like, it, it's very underplayed, but she has the same end of the world fears that he does. So is Miss Laura identifying with him and taking sympathy upon him? Because I, she's found her, basically, like, literal, she found her coping method is the mouth guard and him. Right. And his coping method was his tongue. Right. That's how they stop from grinding their teeth. Okay. She goes out and finds something. She went out and found him, set the trap, right? All right. He's self-destruction. Okay. So he's self-destructing at night. He's self-destructing sleeping with Miss Laura. Uh, he's self-destructing cheating on his girlfriend. He's self-destructing arguing with his mother. So uh, he's self-destructing by choosing to maintain this life in his brother's shadow. Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where one sentence will change the entire piece with Adrian. <laughs> no, I mean, that's what it is. It's, it's right? a good point. It is. And that's something that's, that's very subtle that it's, again, hard to identify if it's purposeful. I would say yes, because, I mean, the way you cleared it up. Uh, but this is, I, I, it's trying to figure out what the author, his intent was. Right. So, so there has to be intent there. So my, my point there is that this end of the world theme, it ends there. Okay. Right. Because there, there is a climax, but there is no payoff with it. There is no verbiage after that point, which allows us to come to reconciliation with the fact that he goes from fearing the end of the world to living in hell. Okay. Right. So for me, that is the problem there. Fair enough. Now, you mentioned this would not be the Juno Diaz piece that you went and picked up off of the shelf. Correct. We read the entire collection of Drown. Yes, we did. Where would you place this story in the in the canon of Drown? Uh, I enjoyed this much more than Drown. Than every story in Drown? So, Absolutely. So, do you, while and whereas this would not have been the piece that you picked up, are you glad that you did read it? Absolutely. I mean, I'm not trying to get at that point whatsoever, but I'm saying if I had no knowledge of Juno Diaz, which before we read Drown, I didn't, and I went to the bookstore, had I saw Drown, I'd be like, all right, short stories. Had I picked up a collection with Miss Laura in it, I wouldn't have jumped and be like, oh, shit, Miss Laura, I should read that. But I'm glad I read this. I think it is very, very different than any of the stories in Drown. Similar elements, but very different. <laughs> Here's the thing. Let me, let, me, let me find some real quick. Okay. So, Huna Diaz. Okay. Nilda. All right. The story that, that as far as I know, and maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Okay. But uh, this is... Oh, shit. I can't remember when this collection was put together, but this is an older collection. I think this is the short story that made Juno Diaz who he is. Put together in 99, it looks okay. like. So, boy, that does not sound right. Anyway, Nilda is the short story that, as far as I know, made him. Let me read you the first line from Nilda. Again, welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where the entire conversation is just railroaded because Adrian has a book on his shelf that references this. And I remember things. So, okay, first line. Nilda was my brother's girlfriend. Second line. This is how all these stories begin. <laughs> Now, there are elements. There are similar elements. There's the cultural elements. There's always the elements of the hypersexual brother. There's always the element of the brother. There is always the brother. It's always the dominant brother. There, yes. Uh, uh, there's the element of the brother who has passed. 
there's a lot of similarities in this. There really yes. is. Uh, but they are different. They are different. Drown is very different than this. Yeah, all the Absolutely. stories in there are different than this. Nilda is different than this, but it's the, the, all the elements are there. Uh, Juno Diaz is a very talented writer. I say yes. He is a writer that everyone who is... Look, if you are a writer, Juno Diaz is someone that you absolutely have to read because of the verisimilitude in his stories. Okay. You read his stories and you understand that's a real person, that's a real place, that could have really happened, probably did. He might know someone that, whose story that is, yeah. right? You feel that in okay. his stories. Uh, now let's talk about Paloma. Okay. The girlfriend, I know you wanted to talk about her a little bit. Uh, go on. What did you have to say? I was just going to get your insight. I know you said you really wanted to touch on her. That was one of your points. Um, I do agree with you. I wish there was more to her. Yes. Because that is a very fascinating character who is attempting to do everything she can to get out of her current lifestyle, her current struggles. And she readily recognizes that one way to get out of this cycle is to not have sex with him because that will end you. Whereas Miss Laura sweeps in, and that's all it is, is this is just sex. Yes. So polar opposites character-wise. Uh, so there is a little bit of interesting fact there. I, I think I really would like to see more of Paloma. Right, and see, we're reading through Harry Potter right now on the channel. Uh, and the In thing case I, you didn't know. Right. The thing that I keep coming back to is the fact that these books would be a lot more interesting if they were written about Hermione. Okay. This short story would be a lot more interesting if it were written about Paloma. Okay. Paloma's the smart one. Paloma's the one that escapes. Paloma's the one that is going to have the life that everyone wants. She goes off to college, and here's the thing, that this, a real small sentence you might not notice if you're just breezing through the story, he never sees her again. It's not just that she leaves him. He never sees her again. He sent her a letter, or she sent him a letter? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, Break up through text. He never sees her again, and we know that he stays in the community. Correct. So that means she's never coming home. Correct. She's gone off. She's made her life. But I, I think it's also real interesting, you know, brought the point that she went away to college. Miss Laura is constantly, constantly struggling. Hey, you got money. Why don't you go to school? Why don't go you to do school, better for I'll yourself? I'll write you the letters. I'll pay for the application fees. Which, again, makes me a terrible person, but where was my Miss Laura? <laughs> uh, so, just saying. Um, but it is interesting. That seems to be, it, it's all about the escape. Here, if we're going to go on personal stories, I am 30 now and wish that I had Miss Laura's and didn't let them pay for anything. Maybe, I wish I'd just been the boy toy, right? I wish maybe, I, maybe there's a Miss Laura in your future. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, how are you feeling about the like mid to late 50s? I, I'm hoping I, I don't become Miss Laura. <laughs> oh, God, I'm the narrator. That's what this is all about. <laughs> don't be silly. <laughs> okay, so anything else you want to preface on now that I just broke my mind? I'm not sure. What would you like to... Did you have any other notes? I don't know. I threw them when you mentioned Paloma. Uh, Jesus Christ. I'm sorry. I'm very disconcerned that you touched my leg and told me that you were my mistress. You're not disconcerned. You're hot and bothered. It, don't. it is a little toasty in here. Excuse me. Um, geez, I don't know. I, I'm really toast on this. Well, let's talk about this point about Miss Laura. She is presumably mid-30s. Our narrator is 16. Yes. She is a sexual predator. Correct. Why do we not think of her that way? Again, I, it comes back to We've take the same 16? age and flip the gender. Yeah, that's a predator. That's a predator, yeah. hands down, no matter what. But having been a 16-year-old male and understanding what the narrator was going through at 16, I would not have identified her as a predator. Right. Which uh, is, <laughs> is a dangerous game to play. Uh, especially if you are 16, looking at someone like Miss Laura. Yeah. So it is interesting, and maybe that is just gender stereotype. You know, it's the whole thing with the uh, the father-son, the father-daughter relationship. You know, the son, ah, he's sexually promiscuous, he's going, that's what boys do. But show help me God, you'll have my daughter back by 9 p.m. Okay. It seems to be a maybe a cultural stereotype, a cultural trope. Uh, well, but who wins because of it? Who wins? Right. I mean, if if we're willing to 
chastise the female without chastising the male on one end of things. Isn't it the male losing and the female not losing out as much? Like this Miss Laura situation, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you do flip the genders, the minute mom knows about it, boy, she's calling the fucking cops. Absolutely. Right. But if you f keep this gender, if at 16 I'm like, yeah, dad, I slept with your friend. I'm probably going, there's going to be some issues. Pull up a chair, son. We got some whiskey to drink. But right. it's not, it's really weird to say. It's not as huge of an issue. Right. Uh, which is bizarre. It really is. Because, yeah, Miss Laura's a fucking predator. Yeah. And not only has she been preying on this narrator, it's apparently she's done this before. At least once. At least once. Within the family. So this is, again, more severe. Yes. Uh, so there's a lot going on here. And... All, you know, seriousness aside, to take this as a joke, there's an episode of South Park, have you seen that? Where, I'm sorry, you don't have TV. The youngest uh, brother in one of the families, Ike, who's basically a toddler, is caught sleeping with his, like, 25-year-old teacher, his preschool teacher. Right. It's South Park. And they go to the cops, and the cops are just like, oh, nice. What do we do with this? Right. And that's what we're getting at this here. Eh? That's what this is coming to. And I, it's... Is it sexist? Is it uh, stereotyping gender? There's a lot going on. Yeah. And it's hard to just hit the nail on the head with this one. Yeah. There's, there's one more point I want to raise. How important is our families to these people? Like, in this culture... That oh, we're family is about, everything. Family is everything, Absolutely. Right? You're, you're, you're living with mom. Mom is everything, right? Here's the thing. The three characters we really have in this story are our narrator... Paloma, the girlfriend, and Miss Laura, right? Okay. Mother's mentioned, brother's mentioned, but they're not characters. They're, yeah, they're not, they're not main characters. They're there. These are the three main characters of the story. Each one of these characters hates their family. Oh, well. well. Uh, you get the feeling that our narrator is doing this in part to spite his family. Maybe this is his escape. Right. Uh, Miss Laura w is running from the shadow of her father, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and Paloma is literally <laughs> trying to escape her family. Yeah. So I, I think that it's interesting that in, in this world where family is everything, uh, everyone hates their family, right? I think that, that that speaks very much to the human experience. It's old Huno, just sitting there making you think. Well, I think it's very much the human experience, isn't it? What would you rate this? What would you give it? I would give this 90 out of 100. 90? I'm yeah. going to say 88. 88. I'm pretty close to you, but I got to lowball you okay. for once in my life. Uh, any suggestions for further reading? You know, you, you, you want to suggest Lolita. You want to suggest Madame Bovary. Uh, so I went with Chuck Palahniuk. Oh, of course. That makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. Marie, if you're watching this, I, I don't want any shit for this. But um, if you enjoy Juno Diaz's style of writing, you would enjoy Chuck Palahniuk. And I think particularly Choke by Chuck Palahniuk. Okay. Uh, I, I do agree with you, Lolita. And we are going to read that next. And I think that's going to stem interesting conversation. Uh, I'm going to do something you may hate me for. I will. Uh, but a, a young up-and-coming writer named Adrian Fort wrote a short story at one point in time. And I identified this. I said, you pulled from Miss Laura when you wrote this. Because that's what I thought. What's that short story called? Do you remember? Summer Romance. Summer Romance. You know where it was published so I can make people read it? I do not remember Crap. right now off the top of my head. Adrian Fort, Summer Romance, The Heir of Innocence is wonderfully captured that short story. You son of a bitch. You're welcome. And that's not prompted. That's from my own personal reading. We'll put it in the link a link in the description below. And now that I said it, he's going to whore himself out. That's how it works. Well, we have to. I think so. So if you like this and you want to hear us talk more about you, whatever, make sure you hit that subscribe button. Give us a like as well. We're really big on likes right now. Follow us on Twitter at Strip Cover and on Facebook at Strip Cover Lit.